Good evening, everyone. It's so great to see you all. And I'm Frank Sasanowski. I'm chair of the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. And welcome. It's so good to thank you for coming from all the places you came from. Thank you. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my life and career are deeply embedded in the rare disease space. Uh, I'm a rare parent and also a rare patient. I was at uh, FDA. I helped implement the Orphan Drug Act 40 years ago when I was, I was about this tall. You know. And uh, yeah, so uh, my research led to the 84 and the 85 amendments, made the law work, and then I was asked to write the implementing regulations. So I've been doing this a long time. And uh, thank you. Thank you. It's been great. It's been an honor to be part of this community. Um, and I have great news for you, great news, because at 3.43 this afternoon, there was a new rare disease therapy approved by the FDA. So our brothers and sisters with Friedrich's ataxia will now have, will now have, Here's the FDA approval letter. It's, uh, and uh, I worked on this drug for about five years, so I'm very happy. <clears throat> you know, the story of that is the story of every one of you, because my friend Ron Bartek, you know, he's, when he and his wife Rachel lost their son to Friedrich's Ataxia, he started, they started, the Friedrich's Ataxia Research Alliance in 1998. And, uh, 25 years, 25 years they've worked raising money, doing research, supporting, and this leads to this day today. Thank you, thank you. But it's, it's our story. This is our story. This is the story of our community. And I'm so happy and grateful that we're back in person, too. And grateful to all of you for all the inconvenience. I've been out there talking to you. You've come from all over the country. You've come here to be here tonight. So thank you for taking that time. We even have, we're thrilled to have registrants from all 50 states and the Puerto Rico. <laughs> And, and for the first time, an official delegation from the Cherokee Nation, led by their first lady, January Hoskin. So welcome. I can speak for ELF when I tell you that we really miss seeing you all. So being uh, with our advocacy community is something that the staff repeatedly tell us is the best part of their job. So when you see the ELF staff too, just, just tell them, you know, they're just beaming. They just love being here with you. And I understand that because it's the best part of my job too. This is a week that can really change your lives and change the policies that impact the lives of all rare disease patients. The programming that we've lined up for you is incredibly thorough and important. So please lean in, Meet as many people as you can, share your ideas, take in other ideas, and enjoy yourself in this dynamic community of rare advocates. Now, for tonight's program, we are here to screen a beautiful film by Natalie Metzger. I hope you're prepared to be deeply moved. Special Blood is a film about families confronting hereditary angioedema. Many of you can recognize the challenges the families in this film confront because it's our story. You'll certainly recognize the courage and determination shown by the young people and the families who are the subjects of the film. I think that you will also relate to the bonds those families build within the HAE community. And we're pleased to have three of the cast here with us tonight. Please meet Kelsey Nearing. <laughs> Noah Davis Logan. and Ava Levy, who came all the way from California. 
These chairs up here are for Kelsey, Noah, and Ava, who will join us after the film for a discussion after the screening. And they'll be joined by my fellow board member, Christina Might and Dylan Simon from the Every Life Policy Committee. I should also mention that we'll hear from the special blood director at the end of the film. Uh, Natalie has a baby that's due any moment, so she recorded something for us. But I want to introduce Andrew from Takeda. This evening's screening and panel discussion are made possible by Takeda Pharmaceutical Limited. I'd like to thank Takeda for their general, generous sponsorship and participation in Rare Disease Week. And representing Takeda here this evening is Andrew Heber. Come on up, Andrew. Andrew is Takeda's Director of Therapeutic Policy and Advocacy for Rare Disease. Andrew, it's all yours. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Frank. As he mentioned, my name's Andrew Hebert. I'm a Director of Therapeutic Area Policy and Advocacy at Takeda. And within my day-to-day -day work, I work with the MPS2 and Gaucher communities, so hopefully I think some of them are in the audience tonight. I want to thank Every Life for their partnership and for the opportunity for Takeda to sponsor tonight's event. Takeda is happy to be a partner to the rare disease community, and we look forward to the rest of the activities this week. I also want to congratulate Every Life on all they're doing for the rare disease community, including being the leaders in helping organize this week's events. So thank you so much, Every Life Foundation. I also want to thank all of you tonight. I know we heard we have folks traveling from California and all the time and sacrifice that you all put to share your story with policymakers this week. It's great to see me vulnerable, share your stories, and hopefully lead to policy change that impacts the entire rare disease community. So thank you again. By listening and learning from our colleagues at Every Life and with the rare disease partners that we work with, we at Takeda have come to understand how difficult it can be for patients and families when seeking an accurate diagnosis. Diagnosis of a rare disease too often means an uncertain and predict unpredictable journey, one that is marked by frustration and a long pathway to get a continuation of care. Like every member of our community, our company recognizes the importance of shortening this journey. In fact, earlier this month, Takeda held a roundtable with members from across the rare disease community representing diverse subpopulations. It helped us learn, identify policy recommendations, and highlight opportunities to improve equity for diagnosis across rare disease patients. And we're excited to present our recommendations later this summer in 2023. For us, this is a small part of an ongoing conversation with the community around patient-centered policy development that supports people living with rare diseases, and Takeda is committed to being a responsible partner at both the federal and state levels. For over 240 years, Takeda has grounded its decision making in the enduring values of patient, trust, reputation, and business in that order. Our work every day with the rare community represents our commitment and my personal commitment to always put patients first. But now it's time to view special blood and learn about the inspiring stories of patients living with HAE. I want to applaud Natalie, as Frank did, a HAE patient herself, for producing such a powerful documentary. I hope it will inspire us all to do more for the rare disease patients that we encounter every day in our lives, and I think it'll serve as a great kickoff for Rare Disease Week. So thank you again for allowing us to sponsor, and please enjoy tonight's film. Wow. Every time I watch that film, I just get chill bumps. Um, I'm Christina casanova Might, and I'm very honored to moderate this panel discussion today. And like all of you, I'm sure you're looking at the panelists up here saying, who are these people? <laughs> like, they've grown so much. It's so inspiring to see such amazing youth advocates already. Um, your stories are so powerful, and the fact that you've shared them with us today is such a gift, and uh, that you're here for Rare Disease Week. Thank you. Like Natalie said, there are some universal themes in this movie that I know I, as a rare disease patient and rare parent, and I'm pretty sure everybody in this audience could relate to from not being listened to in an emergency room to managing the stress, um, stress being a trigger, but what's more stressful than having a rare disease, uh, the issues with getting a diagnosis, uh, 
managing the family, the impact on your siblings and everything else, and your hobbies and your self-identity. So there's so much here, but since this is Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill, we're gonna try to you know, keep this towards you know, action and what we can do to help patients like yourselves and our community make a greater impact on Capitol Hill. So as we saw, you know, Natalie is an HAE patient, and so many of your family members are too. How did that impact y'all's decision to participate in this documentary? And, and what was it like to tell your story with somebody who's also a patient who understood? Who wants to go first? Um, so I have a, uh, hi everyone, I'm Kelsey. Um, <laughs> I, um, I have a unique situation. I don't actually have any family members um, with HAE, but um, funny enough, Natalie was the first person that I met, the first patient um, that I met. So um, she was a big part of my journey in getting involved um, with advocacy. So um, I met Natalie, and then shortly after, she asked um, if we wanted to participate, and. My entire family was, was gung-ho, um, just completely um, thrilled with the opportunity and it's opened so many doors for me since and for the community. Um, so that's, that's my situation. Yeah, and just to add on to that, uh, hello everyone. First off, my name is Noah. And uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. And just to speak about the importance of having a director who also has HA, it meant the world to me. And it meant so much for me because it's somebody else who understands the struggle. And more so that the film isn't being made for mere entertainment or for enjoyment. The film's being made to have an impact. And that the challenge of the movie, the mission of the movie, its purpose, was actually fulfilled. Because this is shown in ER rooms, this is shown in hospitals, this is shown in professionals. And this movie has truly made a change in our community and the rare disease space as well. So it was an honor and it was amazing to be a part of that production. So thank you, Natalie, again, and for all of you for being here as well. Wow, thank you. Hi, I'm Eva. And um, um, I started, the, dis the documentary was filmed. At, I was very young, as you saw, so my parents kind of made like the decision to be a part of it, but it really taught me and it showed me so many people with a rare disease and I felt that I wasn't alone and I met such great people through like this community that um, I could share that I have the same disease as them and they really understood what I was going through at a young age and they went through very similar things as me. You're just so adorable. You're reminding me of my daughter. <laughs> it's just so big. Um, so now I've got a few questions that I'm going to go through before I open it up to the audience, because I know that all of you have some questions as well. But Noah, first of all, when are you running? <laughs> <laughs> like, us, but, OK, because soon, I know, I know there's some limits here, but that's why we're on Capitol Hill. Uh, but the, yeah, we will. I know he'd sign it, so. <laughs> but your family's just amazing. You can see all of your families are, but there's so much love and support, and it was so interesting to see the generational dynamic um, and how do you help each other, because it seemed like you were like, just don't stress, just relax. Like, I'm like, yeah, I wish it was that easy, but how do you do it and how, how does it work for all of you? I think um, a large part of it has to go to my mother. She's my world and my everything. And my mother taught me, thank you, I appreciate that. I love for all the moms out there. <laughs> and the thing about family, and I think this is true for any rare disease, but especially for HAE, it's almost like you feel alone a lot, that's a major point. And you have so much confusion, you have so many questions, and it's almost like, what do I do? And the fact that I have people that can relate to me and answer those questions is everything. I mean, I can just ask my mom, like, oh, what am I supposed to do when she's there for me? I can text my grandma if my mom's not there and she's also there for me. So having that support is just so useful for, and is the main reason why I can be so calm, why I can have an ordinary life, and all of that is thanks to them. So having a family means everything, and I think it's more than just that support system, but also everyone here as well, everyone in the HAEA, and especially everyone next to me. 
I think the relationships that I formed was also another family. And I'm extremely thankful for that. And that's just as important in support in regards to my health as well. So thank you guys for that too. Yeah. So Kelsey, because you didn't have that same kind of structure, I have to make the comment that my daughter made when you have the most amazing hair. Like every time I was like, who's this girl? Oh. Yeah, and today I was like, wait, who's that? Oh wait, it's Kelsey. It's a running joke that every time we filmed, I had a different haircut or hair color, so. I love it, I love it. I've decided to stick with this, so. <laughs> For now. Um, but you've endured a long road to a diagnosis, um, and the burden study for rare disease that was uh, done by the Every Life Foundation determined that the average amount of time between the onset of symptoms and diagnosis is about 6.3 years. And the physician in the film stated that HAE, at least in the time of the filming, could take more like 10 to 15 years, which is obviously way too long. Meanwhile, you're enduring misdiagnosis, you think you're going crazy, they're, they're you know, giving you unnecessary surgeries. Tell us about your experience, if you're okay with that, and, and what did receiving an accurate diagnosis mean to you? Um, so my mom has always said, like, she knew something was wrong, um, and nobody, nobody listened to her. Um, I was a colicky baby, and then, you know, I, I hit age 10 and had exercise-induced asthma and all these allergies, and, you know, I kept going to the hospital, you know, from age 10 to age 14 was really when things started to pick up for me, and, um, you know, I was referred to a psychiatrist, and um, finally we found a doctor who said, worst case scenario, this is what it is, so I'm gonna send you to a specialist. Um, and he's still my doctor today. Um, <laughs> and he's the one who diagnosed me. Um, but what was frustrating for me was I got this diagnosis, but it was like a half diagnosis. It was like, okay, you have hereditary angioedema, but you also have this subset of hereditary angioedema that we don't know much about. The drugs aren't approved. You're gonna have to use them off label. Um, so that's a, that was a huge battle for me, and it's still a battle today because I have HAE with normal C1. Um, and my mom, you know, my mom is lucky that she doesn't have HAE. She was able to put her heart and soul into helping me because she didn't have, like, you know, like your families do, um, she didn't have a, a chronic illness. She wasn't in pain, so she was lucky. Um, to be able to provide that support to me. And I had two parents that weren't sick. Um, but it's frustrating, it's still frustrating. And there's, um, there's a lot more that can be done, um, even though we've made a lot of progress. I do, I, I think that that's something that we still struggle with, um, not just with HAE, but um, you know, like drug approvals and you know, insurance battles and stuff like that. So, that's a big part. Um, even though I'm I'm healthy now, you know, there's always that looming, you know, doom and gloom of, am I going to be able to get these medications? Oh yeah, access. So many. I I think there was a lot of nodding heads in the audience as you saw. This is so relatable. Well, to put one more person, well, two more people under the spotlight, but Ava, <laughs> you know, you go first. <laughs> um, in the filming, you were in and out of the ER, like they said, every 10 days. Like, my heart was just breaking for you. How have therapies since made an impact or helped you manage that? And, you know, what, what experience have you had in getting access to those treatments or that you and your family have had? Well, since filming the documentary, I'm on preventative medication that I take twice a week subcutaneously mm -hmm. um, in my stomach. And um, I got this medication five years ago, and it wasn't, I was on a waiting list, and then when I got off the waiting list, it wasn't FDA approved for my age. My parents really had to fight um, with the insurance company to allow me to take this medication, and they wouldn't cover it. And they had to go back to the drug company and ask for like patient assistant fund 
to help like cover for the medication because it's very expensive and I have to go back every year and reapply and it really shouldn't be this hard for people with rare diseases. Absolutely. Those are the kinds of stories that hopefully we're going to be telling on Capitol Hill tomorrow, or on, on what, Thursday. But um, it's so incredibly powerful. Dylan, you're not safe. <laughs> you knew you weren't going to be safe. You were trying to hide back there. Um, only 5% of rare diseases have an FDA-approved therapy. And in the film, they said that the first HA treatment came about in 2009. What did policies like the Orphan Drug Act do to help this and therapies that come about? And what policy changes can we advocate for this week, ODA 2.0, <laughs> that would help <laughs> enable? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that would help enable therapy development in this very critical disease area. So the Orphan Drug Act um, played obviously a huge role in this, and so obviously we are at the 40th anniversary of ODA, and that helped to create an incentive structure to start to see some development of these rare disease treatments. And, and we know that it's, it's been so impactful uh, going from only 38 uh, rare disease treatments to over 1,100, and, and that's real progress, but we also know that that is just a start. We, we need to continue to move forward, and the 40th anniversary is great. It's great to celebrate all the great work that the Orphan Drug Act has done, but we also know we need to continue to move forward. Uh, and so we'll talk a lot more about all of this tomorrow, I do promise, uh, but some areas that we can continue to be talking about is how do we continue to ensure the fact that expertise at the FDA is being shared across the entire FDA? And so you're not getting silo silos of expertise, uh, ensuring the fact that experts can utilize that information uh, across the entire agency to ensure the fact that we are increasing the access um, to the expertise and increasing the approvals for these rare disease treatments. Uh, in addition, we also want to look at how can we support increased funding for rare disease research. You saw in the documentary uh, the new research center uh, at UC San Diego, and, and it's, it's programs like that, it's research like that that paves the way for these new therapies. So how can we increase rare disease research uh, at the FDA? How can we increase rare disease research at NCATS within NIH to ensure the fact that the science is there, we can develop the science, we can develop the therapy so that we can see more and more of these FDA approvals. Uh, in addition, looking at ultra rare, um, ultra rare has its own unique set of, uh, of challenges. And so we'll talk a lot more about this tomorrow, but how can we start uh, addressing some of those challenges within the ultra rare community uh, to ensure the fact that we, the benefits that the rare community has seen through ODA is also impacting the ultra rare community. Uh, and lastly, we'll talk a little bit about how we can share the fact that patient experiences are being included within the FDA approval process. Uh, that's such a key part, obviously, with patient-focused drug development. Uh, we're seeing more and more of that increase through the user fee uh, agreements, uh, but we want to continue to push that forward and ensure the fact that that patient-focused information, that patient experience is formally being included uh, within the FDA process and it, it, within the FDA approval process. because. Having uh, patient-focused drug development is great, uh, and it's a, it's a great step forward, but we need to take another step forward, ensuring the fact that it is officially within that benefit framework. Um, and so you'll hear that word again tomorrow, benefit. Uh, and so that is a few of the areas. Um, there's a lot more that we can get into, uh, and again, we'll do a little bit of that tomorrow. Again, happy to answer some questions today as well. Uh, but luckily, there, there are not a shortage of policy areas in which we can be advocating for. Uh, and so I talked a lot about regulatory issues today, uh, but they're a fair amount as well um, that can help us move forward and see more rare disease therapies. Absolutely, thank you, Dylan. Everything from access to diagnosis, you know, newborn screening, all of these things really do tie together to ensure that people get the therapies that they need when they need them. Um, so I have a few extra questions myself, but I also wanted to make sure that we had enough time to take any questions from the audience before I, you know, indulge my, my questions. So, do we, I see one back there. I wonder what you're doing now. Yeah, that was one of my questions. <laughs> I think 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah, for people who don't want to be yelling, and I appreciate you, sir, that that was fantastic. We definitely heard you. Um, but we do have mic runners, uh, so if you just raise your hand, they'll be able to get to you. Okay, Noah, would you like to go first? Yeah, I can start. So um, I'm now a freshman in college, and I'm currently studying political science. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So obviously I gave up on being a rocket scientist, but I am still interested in being president, so that's a big goal. <laughs> and I also advocate whenever I can. I've given speeches at conferences, colleges, sports events, and even internationally, so I've been blessed with that. And I speak out for the HAEA mainly, but also some small companies in regards to therapies as well. I'm a keynote speaker for my current Rook Nest. And uh, besides that, I don't do track. I actually used to do track. I no longer play basketball. Sadly, and I don't play football, but it's okay because we move on to more important things. So advocacy is taking over my life, and that's the most important thing to me now, and that's about it. Thank you. For me, um, I'm in seventh grade now, and I play sports and I do activities outside of school like basketball, volleyball. I really got into baking over like COVID. <laughs> I even sell my things and donate some money to find a cure for HAE. And I still really like to advocate, especially to youth, to share my story to other kids so they know that they're not alone and there's kids just like them that have rare diseases. Um, so, life update. I am not a medical doctor. Um, I know it said in the, that's what I was going for. I actually, um, I graduated in 2021 with, um, I'm a lawyer now. Um, <laughs> and a big part of that decision for me was I'd spent so much time um, in hospitals. I spent so much time with doctors. I kind of got sick of it. Um, <laughs> And I felt like I had really good, um, I had good doctors, I had medical backing. Um, where we were really lacking was the follow through. It, it's the, the policies um, and something, you know, the HAEA, um, a, a foundation that we work, I work really closely with, um, was a big part in that career change for me, was how can I learn and better myself to be the best advocate and that's why I went to law school. Now I'm not working um, in the field but I really hope now that I'm kind of getting my career started to put a little bit more effort um, towards, you know, I'm, I'm from Illinois, towards going to Springfield um, and, you know, doing things on a federal level. Um, that's what I want to do and the HAEA has been a huge part of that, as well as all sorts of other foundations like the Every Life Foundation. So that's my goal. <laughs> Hi. Um, I think that what resonated with me in the documentary probably is um, I'm sure I'm not the only one. And that was when I saw your whole community coming together and the power of community and finding people, especially when you're rare, you know. Um, um, I think um, you had mentioned that Natalie was the first person that you ever met who had that rare disease. And um, I, I felt the same way when I met our uh, rare disease community. Uh, I, f I, I used to say that I felt like, you know, an adopted child who just found her birth family. And, um, you know, what also resonated with me, though, was, um, was Ava, your mom, when she kind of broke down a bit because you got a little bent out of shape about having the Band-Aid ripped off. And um, she said, Can give me a break, I almost lost you. And I thought... That, as, as a mother, I'm a mother of a, of a rare disease patient, and our kids um, in our community can't speak for themselves, so we have to do it ourselves. And seeing a movie like this, I feel like, um, I'm sure we all wish that we had a movie like this for our own rare diseases, and I'm really interested in knowing how has this movie changed things for your community, and 
and ob obviously I think that there, there are more treatments out there now. So how has that movie impacted um, changes? Um, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, I showed this movie um, at my high school, um, gosh, back in 2014, 2015, was 2015 when the movie was released. Yeah. Um, and they found somebody else at my high school um, with HAE. Um, wow. So it, just little things like that. And I've heard stories like that from so many other people. Um, and I, Natalie spoke to that a little bit. Um, but just, you know, every person that watches the movie, um, you know, they learn something, but it also causes them to think, does this person have that? Or should I tell my doctor about this? Um, and I think, you know, something that's unique is we've all grown up together at this point. Um, I mean, like my, like my little siblings, you know, we just live in different parts of the country. Um, but it's been really impactful in ways that I don't think I ever thought it would be. Yeah, and I think that it's also had a very grand effect on our community as well when it comes to like practical usage. Because um, one of the main points is this was shown to like EMT nurses and other healthcare professionals. So I think obviously advocacy is one of the most important steps in regards to research and funding and access to medication. But it's also important when it comes to misdiagnosis. That's one of the big parts of all rare diseases is how we're treated incorrectly. So I think that it really helps to get correct treatment plans out there and also to help Medicare, like medical professionals, almost get a sense of what HAE is. And I think this movie is like very vital in understanding that, and it definitely helps. And going off that, I show this documentary to my friends and my teachers and just like to really share what I went through and what my close friends went through and to really explain to them. And they love learning about it, and I really like showing people and I tell everyone I can, <laughs> especially like at camp, everyone asks me and I was like, oh yeah, and there's, a, I'm in a documentary and they're like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's really cool. I showed it to my boyfriend on our third date, just so that he knew what he was getting into. We're still together. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah, I, I have one. So I just wanted to um, really share my appreciation with you guys being in the documentary and then coming up here and sharing with everyone your life. Um, the, the fact that you continue to advocate by telling your story and, and being a part of the community is really what's needed um, in advancing legislation, you know, really making change. So, so thank you for that. Um, I was curious, we're here, you know, talking about um, trying to, to get forth uh, legislation at the federal level. And it's very encouraging that, uh, that Noah, you're taking, uh, you're in political science, and um, Leslie, you're, uh, you're a lawyer, and I, it's, it's very important that we have um, conversations with legislators. But I also think, and then Noah, you, you talked about the fact that you're in conversation with, with companies, so I'm wondering if, if maybe you have had, uh, any, any three of you have had conversations um, with pharmaceutical company, people from pharmaceutical companies, people from, um, from uh, insurance companies, and try to, to figure out if they are also willing to help you alleviate these problems that you've encountered, uh, accessing medications, accessing treatment, as you were talking about earlier, and if there, if you've noticed that there that there are companies that are on your side in in this in this battle, along with legislators. Yeah, I mean, um, I am I'm 25, um, a dreadful age, as I'm sure many of you know. I turned 26 in July, and I have to come off my parents' insurance. Um, so a big part of that has been me making phone calls, you know, like, "Hey, what's going to happen?" Um, and come to find out my um, HAE medications are excluded from my, yeah. my employer's policy, um, which just kind of feels like a workaround to all the work that we did with the Affordable Care Act, right? It's like we're going to exclude this entire class of drugs. Um, so that's been something that's new to me that I'm still navigating, but um, actually I have a rep who lives 15 minutes away from me with Takeda, 
who is like, don't, don't worry. We're going to figure it out and we're going to do it together. Um, so that's been, that's been really helpful to me knowing that I have, you know, a, a team of people, um, with pharmaceutical companies, um, behind me. It hasn't been the best conversation with my employer. Um, so we'll <laughs> cross that bridge when it comes, but, um, it's, you know, it's mixed. It's, you know, it's 50, 50 really for me. It's, you know, sometimes you get people that are like, don't worry about it. And some people are like, oh, well, um, and it's frustrating. Yeah, I agree. I think historically, um, especially when I was young, I was diagnosed at a very young age. So they had no treatments approved for the use for the pediatric population. So they gave me um, androgens with hopes of preventing my attacks, and they didn't, which is why I was in the hospital for three months at the age of six. And that part of my story is where my mother was in constant fights with insurance and medication. And that's where it was a very bad time for us. But because of what happened, ironically, I've actually had nothing but good experiences past. So ever since, I've been in very good and very constant uh, communication with my insurance companies and also the medication companies as well. I'm actually familiar with most of the therapies that are in approval today. So um, I'm very fortunate and very blessed to have the opportunity and also that privilege as well. But I also speak at Capitol Hill. We did this a couple years ago, I believe it was 2019, last time I was up here. And we spoke with our representatives and with our congressmen and with their people. And the main thing is, is that we need treatment, that we need this access to treatment. We shouldn't have to deal with this fight. So my first time here at Capitol Hill was to speak about that and to share my story and all of our stories, basically, that there's no reason why we should endure this pain. Mm -hmm. Hi, the documentary was beautiful. I love coming here to be able to put faces to these new diagnoses I may not have known about before. So thank you for helping educate us on that. Um, I know all of us here would know the importance of newborn screening. Is AJE something that would benefit from newborn screenings, or is that something you need to discover and diagnose later in life? So as far as I know, um, it depends on what type you have. I know for me, we don't know where my mutation comes from, so it's, you know, there's no screening. There, we don't know what caused my um, HAE is a spontaneous mutation, and we don't know what that mutation is, but I'm pr it's probably different for the two of you. My, my dad has it, and so at birth, they tested the cord blood for the chromosome if it mutated, and um, after two weeks, I knew that I had HAE too, and my first um, attack was when I was 18 months, but looking at like photos, we could see that it was probably even when I was younger, but, um, but I didn't really know. Yeah, and I have a very similar story. Uh, my mother didn't get me diagnosed at birth. She tried to, but the doctor refused, which is also another aspect of the rare disease population and community. But um, I was actually diagnosed at the age of three. So it wasn't newborn screening, but it was also early on. I did have attacks very early on as well. I'm happy to jump in here, actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, for those who know me, I work a lot in diagnostics uh, at the foundation and do a lot of newborn screening work. Um, HAE 100% would benefit from newborn screening. Um, and so it, it's identifying how to build that package uh, for either state or for the ROSP. Um, but this idea of having that early diagnosis so you have, so you're aware that if attack does come, you have the treatment available. Um, that feels like a, what newborn screening was set up to do. Um, and so where the HAA community is versus where they need to be to have a package that they can present on newborn screening, I, I have no idea. Obviously, I, I do not work specifically with the community, but in terms of would HAE benefit from newborn screening, uh, I think that's a clear yes. Hi there. Um, first of all, let me thank everyone up on the panel for for your sharing, your deep sharing, um, and everyone that came up here to DC, those that couldn't come up here, and there's a lot of us carrying that banner for them. So for all the rare disease patients and the families and all that we've been through, uh, I came up here also in 2019 and um, was carrying that banner. And so my question is, and maybe I'm jumping the gun and you'll bring it up tomorrow, but 
the need for that center of excellence for rare disease and what the center of excellence for cancer and how quickly it gets diagnosed. When I went to NIH and, I, and I'm talking to these researchers and, and they're, they're out there on holidays and they're, they're, they're analyzing data and they're doing all this stuff and they're trying and trying and trying to get these things here, but only to have somebody new show up in FDA and they change the, the, the flow to things. And so my question is, is where are we with this center of excellence? Is, do we have that in that benefits? Like, right, so what's going on? That's a question for me. Um, <laughs> that was. So we'll, we're going to talk a lot more about this tomorrow. Um, and so uh, obviously last year we had the STAT Act. Um, as many of you are aware, there had been some conversations uh, with FDA in terms of the Center of Excellence for a Rare Disease Center of Excellence, and not necessarily some agreement on that is necessary, uh, but we are talking about uh, working with the FDA in terms of identifying how that expertise can go across the entire agency. And so really get to the idea of a Center of Excellence, which at the core of the idea of a Center of Excellence is how do we ensure the fact that the expertise that is at CEDAR versus CBER uh, is not being siloed and is brought together. And to your point, if somebody's leaving, that if somebody new comes in, that they can speak to their new peers at FDA to understand what that's about. And so while tomorrow we're not going to be talking directly about the STAT Act itself, uh, we're going to be having conversations around ways that we can continue to advocate to ensure the fact that that expertise is being shared across the entire FDA. Because if, if it's not our center of excellence, it, we still need to ensure the fact that we're not having that siloed expertise, that we need to bring the expertise together at the FDA to ensure to benefit the entire rare disease community. And, and see, and that's where I'm, I know I don't have a mic, but, um, <laughs> sorry. but that's where I'm saying, like, we need to streamline because that also financially streamlines a lot. And whenever we can get quicker access, then that is less and less people, money coming out of Medicaid, Medicare. So if we're on, if everybody's trying to save so much money in the budget, we need to put that behind the cure. The only way to do that is to get it streamlined. We need a center of excellence. I don't know what we have to do for that, but you tell me and we'll, we'll go there. We'll dig into it tomorrow, I promise. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for being so vulnerable and honest and sharing your story. Um, I live with a rare disease, complex regional pain syndrome. Um, it's the most painful condition known to modern medicine, and it's actually called the suicide disease because patients really feel no other way out. Um, but I kind of wanted to echo what Kelsey said, and I think a lot of rare disease patients can um, relate to the insurance aspect of it. Um, with CRPS, they don't know what causes it. There's no treatment. There's no cure. They kind of just treat the symptoms. And the treatment that I was getting is $15,000, and I was getting it weekly for over a year. Um, right now I'm getting it every other week. But my dad is only working because I'm on his insurance because I'm disabled and it's covered. And I've been working for over a year now to try to figure out if Medicare or Medicaid will cover it. And they just kind of give you the runaround. And when you're a chronic disease patient, a rare disease patient, you have enough on your plate already. And I feel like insurance companies are just making it so hard for patients. Um, does anyone have any advice or... Kelsey, have you come across any like successes that you can share with when it comes to insurance? Um, well, I one tactic that my mom used I, when I was younger, and we were kind of going through the same thing, right? It's like, you know, you're you're too young to use the medicines. You finally get the medicines, and then you turn 26, and you're back in the same boat. Um, my mom took me down to the insurance company's office and was like, "Look at my kid." You know, I mean, she dragged me in there. She put me on the phone. And I know that it's just, it's frustrating when you're, when you're not feeling good. Like, you know, you, I'm sure you're in pain. And it's just, like, you just literally have to keep bothering these people. I, that's literally what it comes down to is just annoy them until, they've, until they tell you yes. I mean, because that's the thing that's worked the best for me and my mom. And I'm sure for... 
your parents too. I mean, I know you're, I know it's worked for your mom, but I, and I, it's frustrating. Um, you know, and that's part of why I decided to become a lawyer so that, you know, there's a little bit more bite behind it, I guess. That's really good to hear. And I've been doing the same thing, sending emails, making phone calls. And actually last year during Rare Across America, um, I was the only person in the meeting and I had the opportunity to bring this up and they connected me to a social worker or to Medicare and Medicaid. And unfortunately my diagnosis doesn't fall under one of the covered uh, diagnoses for this treatment. So still trying to find a way, but I'll just keep fighting. There are so many resources, you just have to find them. Um, I stumbled across my first um, medication because somebody gave my mom the wrong phone number. That's how I got my first medication, was somebody accidentally gave my mom a drug rep phone number instead of an advocate phone number. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> and I'm always, I tell my story to everyone because I feel like if you just have to talk to that right, that one person, and that will make the difference. So I just keep pushing for that. Yeah, don't lose faith. Thank you. Don't lose faith. <laughs> Thank you. I also just want to jump in real quick. Um, in terms of the access space, this is something that the Every Life Foundation is working hard at uh, and identifying some of these challenges uh, because while these are wonderful stories to hear about your persistence leading to uh, the access you need, uh, that's not a policy that you can. Uh, use across the federal government. Uh, and so uh, both at the federal and state level, uh, the foundation is, is looking at ways that we can help to improve areas like that and advocating for easier access. Mm -hmm. I first just wanted to say what an incredible group of youth uh, advocates you are, really inspiring. All three of you are just a great voice um, for this platform. So I just wanted to say that um, really stellar group. Um, the first thing when we sat for the, I, I didn't, we had, you know, I had no idea what the screening was and I didn't look at it and, um, you know, I represent a, a rare disease as a, as a parent, um, but also happen to be a medical professional. And the first thing my husband and I looked at each other, I worked, um, I was a traveling nurse in Boston, and this is 1999, 2000. I remember because I worked Y2K when the whole world was gonna shut down that night. <laughs> and um, I, they would leave me on this, I worked on a general clinical research unit. And so they would do anything that was like clinical trials um, in, in, at Boston Children's. And I was by myself and I didn't even work at that hospital and I, you know, I was kind of like a new grad, you know, I was probably 25 year age, Kelsey. And they said, well, we have this one study called the Hay Study. And the Hay Study, I'll never forget because I was petrified as a nurse. They said, they may come in in the middle of the night and you're gonna give them this medication and then you have to do like labs every 15 minutes, half hour, hour to do like pharmacokinetics. That was in 1999, and the drug didn't get introduced until 2009. It's just something to say because I think to myself, if they're like, you have to be really careful because they might not be able to breathe suddenly. And I'm like, and I'm going to be by myself putting an IV in them, by, like uh, all by myself? And they said, yep. And you have to give them this medicine, and it just like it just put everything together. Like I was afraid as the nurse that someone was gonna show up in the middle of the night when I was on shift. Um, no one did um, while in, in the three months I was there, but it, I guess this, the side of the access just jumps into my head because that was in 1999 that they had a treatment and it just, it took that long to come to fruition. And I think it just says something about why we're all here as advocates, because they had those answers long before it got approved. So just blows my mind a little. Wow, thank you for sharing that. That's, it's crazy how far it's come and how long it, it, the process really does take. I wanted to confirm, are all of you participating in tomorrow's conference? By any chance? No, you're not. You're leaving. I was like, I, I'm sure you could speak to, to this mom about <laughs> some of the insurance issues, and she could give you some tips. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, when, when my daughter, hi, I'm Elise. I'm Ava's mom. When Ava was young, we were denied a lot of medication due to her age. And um, 
I said, I worked Monday through Thursday, and every Friday I would call the insurance companies, and I would say to them, you're not going to get rid of me. I'm going to call you every Friday. And I did it for two years straight. And I literally said to them, I'm not going to give up until I get what I want. I, and I literally had to go to the state capital. Like, I, I'm from California, and we had to go. To, we took it all the way to the capital, and I appealed them. And I kept appealing and appealing, and I won the case because I didn't say no. And they had, to, they had to reimburse me for all the money that I spent on her medicine because they weren't going to give it to me. I had to, we had to take it out of our pocket. And at that point, time, I had my husband on medication, and I had my daughter on medication. And we were like in debt, I think like, like over $90,000, I think, at that point, because we had to get medicine. Or my, you know, they were going to, what do I, you know, what do we do? Both people need medicine. And we won because I wasn't going to give up. And so my advice to you is don't let anyone say no to you. If they say no, then you ask for a supervisor. And if they say no, you ask for another supervisor. And if they say no, you ask for another supervisor. And you never take no for an answer. That's, that's what I did. And to this day, I teach my daughter, you, you know, don't let anyone say no to you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, hi, my name is Ronan. I'm going to just jump in here because I had a similar. When I wasn't on Friday, I would take over and call. Um, there was one incident that I would like to share with you guys. That, um, but, but first, before I do that, can I get a raise of hands for anybody in here that is um, living with a rare disease or caring for someone with a rare disease? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to bond with those hands, that's all. <laughs> so um, before we were approved, I got a, had to took several days to get a manager on the phone from Anthem Blue Cross. And once I got her on the phone, I, um, she said that she needed certain things that were not available, you know, right? Like there was a bin number that was wrong or an account number that was wrong. Um, then the doctor needed to get on the phone. So I got the doctor on the phone at the same time that she was on the phone. And she said, I need to do something wrong with the prescription, the way it's written. Now, what I did was I never hung up the phone. So, and then, the, and then, then they needed another department to get on the phone with them as well. I had four people on the phone almost the entire day. During that day, I was chopping down a tree stump in my backyard. <laughs> I, I, I completed that task, still on the phone with four people. <laughs> The doctor, the two, in, and two, two insurance companies. Then I was sweaty, so I took a shower, still on the phone. <laughs> right? You just don't say no. And then I went to the supermarket and came back home and unloaded the supermarket, still on the phone. It took literally all day. But by getting all four of those people and not saying no, um, I was able, by the end of the day, I was able to get what I needed to get done to get approved. <laughs> Well, I hate to cut this a little bit short, but that's like the perfect note to end on, that tenacity, that perseverance that hopefully we will all be taking with us in through tomorrow and Thursday. I'm so excited and grateful to all of you and everyone here and our sponsors for making this night possible. I mean, I feel totally empowered and prepared and, and just ready to go. And hopefully I'll see as many of you as I can tomorrow morning, bright and early. It's still going to be in this same building on the concourse level in the atrium hall. And that's the atrium hall that's closest to the 14th Street entrance of the Ronald Reagan building. Okay. And registration opens at 8, but things don't start until 9.15. However, breakfast will be here. And as you know, every life always has wonderful food. <laughs> so if you want to have a wonderful breakfast, Come on, the legislative conference, like I said, will kick off at 9.15, and it's gonna proceed until 4.45, but there are very important things that you have to do during that time, such as take a beautiful group photo and spend time meeting other people in your state during lunch and doing all of the amazing networking and learning from each other, those kinds of lessons that make us more powerful advocates, not just on Capitol Hill, but with our care providers and with our insurance uh, and with everybody else back at home because policy is everywhere and we are all need, you know, this expertise and advocacy to take it on 
together. So hopefully you are as pumped as I am for tomorrow's conference to prepare for your meetings with your representatives and senators. And I look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, every life. Thank you all.